Hi, everyone. Um, we'd like to welcome you to the 14th Annual Human Development Conference. We are so excited to have you join us here, both in person and virtually. We are the co-chairs for this year's conference. Hi, my name is Stella Cho, and I'm a Notre Dame senior studying neuroscience and Spanish um, with a specific interest in public health in Latin America. I'm Maria Thiel. I'm also a Notre Dame senior studying political science, French, and international development studies. My development interests lie in global education. The University of Notre Dame's Human Development Conference is a student-led conference dedicated to presenting development research. Our conference has provided a forum for undergraduate students from around the world and from a wide range of disciplines to participate in enriching dialogue about development-focused research. Since last July, we began brainstorming about what we wanted to address within our conference. During these past two years, we saw our lives and the world around us shift and adapt in so many ways. Even today, the pandemic continues to further inequality at all levels, disproportionately affecting vulnerable populations. Therefore, this year's theme is our global responsibility, seeking inclusive growth amidst widening inequality. This weekend, we gather to explore inclusive growth beyond an economic sense, but rather taking a person-centered approach in the pursuit of equality, sustainable global development, and resilience in the face of widening inequality. We want to emphasize the continued need for interdisciplinary innovation and our responsibility as global citizens for collaboration during these times of widespread disparity. Today, we will begin with a keynote address from Mr. John Cavana, the former director and now senior advisor at the Institute for Policy Studies. Our keynote will be followed by a mixed media display and reception event. Tomorrow, we will showcase research panels and engage in active discussions about a wide variety of topics with panels including our relationship with the land, sustainable solutions for the most vulnerable, and women's health and well-being, bridging the gender gap in healthcare, and many others. The research is interdisciplinary, much like our own backgrounds that we have brought to designing the conference, but all united under the theme of addressing global inequality. As an international development studies minor, my academic background has led me to a career focus in international development, specifically education. I now conduct research in multilingual education in Senegal and hope to live in Senegal after graduation working as a teacher. Combining my dual interests in neuroscience and Spanish, I worked for two months at a local public health clinic in Patsun, Guatemala. Here, I discovered a newfound passion for global health, which has inspired me to pursue an MD MPH in the future. While our development interests span from education to public health, the undergraduate researchers will present on an even wider range of topics centering around a global responsibility for addressing inequality. As you listen to tomorrow's research panels, we invite you to learn more about these topics and more importantly, to reflect on them even after this weekend. We want to thank the Kellogg Institute for International Studies, the Ford Program, the Center for Social Concerns, SIT Study Abroad, and the University of Notre Dame for helping us make this year's conference possible. A special thank you to everyone who supported us during these several months. We'd love for everyone on our HTC committees and the faculty and staff that have guided us in planning the conference to stand to be recognized. Thank you all. In a minute, we will turn to Professor Ray Offenheiser, who will formally introduce our keynote speaker. Professor Offenheiser is the director of the Pulte Institute for Global Development and former president of Oxfam America. And he has been an enormous resource for us in connecting us with the keynote speaker. On behalf of our Human Development Conference organizing committees, we wanna say once more, welcome. We are so grateful to have you with us this weekend. Thank you. So good afternoon, everyone, and, uh, and welcome. Uh, and I wanna thank Stella and Maria and congratulate both of them on uh, all the hard work that has gone into assembling this conference. Having been to a few of them in the past, I know what's involved. So, and it's not an easy task, especially uh, in these particularly challenging times. I'm delighted today to actually have this opportunity to introduce John Cavana, a friend and fellow activist who I've worked with in Washington over many of the last 20 years. John is an economist and current board member and former director of the Institute for Policy Studies, a proudly progressive think tank in Washington, DC, and an institute that he actually led for 20 years. IPS is one of Washington's oldest think tanks 
founded in 1963 by Marcus Raskin and Richard Barnett, who both believed that Washington needed a truly independent think tank, free from government funding and unafraid to speak truth to power. They also believe that the major questions of government are not just administrative questions, but also actually moral questions. IPS became famous for its vocal opposition to the Vietnam War, for its support for civil rights, for an early focus on globalization, and under John's leadership, opposition to the Iraq War, a focus on economic justice and inequality, and the, which is particularly the focus of this year's conference. Prior to joining IPS, John worked for the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development and the World Health Organization. In 1983, he joined IPS and directed his global economy project from 1983 to 1997. He was a founding fellow of the Transnational Institute and helped establish the International Forum on Globalization. And, and over several decades, he's been an influential advisor to the Congressional Progressive Caucus and the AFL-CIO. John is the co-author of 10 books and numerous articles on globalization. Most notably, his collaboration with Richard Barnett for the book entitled Global Dreams, Imperial Corporations, and the New World Order. His collaboration also with Robin Braun on development redefined how the market has met its match. And his latest book, another collaboration with Robert Broad, entitled Water Defenders, How Ordinary People Saved a Nation from Corporate Greed, which we're going to touch upon here today. I think the copy of the book is right there. Um, and maybe just on a personal note, I would like to say that oftentimes people who devote as many years as John has to working on poverty and inequality issues uh, in the vineyard, so to speak, um, aren't often recognized for that because the general society doesn't necessarily reward poverty-related work. Um, but I would just simply like to uh, compliment John on all of these years of service um, to people here in the United States and around the world on human rights issues and social justice questions. So with that, I'm pleased to introduce John Cavana uh, and now turn to Stella and Maria to lead our discussion. Thank you all very much for joining us. Thank you, Professor Offenheiser, and thank you for joining us, Mr. Cavana. We'll begin the keynote with some questions for you um, regarding your work with the Policy Inst Institute for Policy Studies and your experiences through which you've actively addressed widening in inequality. So first, if you could please tell us a little bit about yourself and the Institute for Policy Studies, which is a progressive think tank in Washington, DC. How does your work at IPS address the concepts of globalization and human development? Great, thanks so much, Stella and Maria, and also to Ray, uh, for that beautiful introduction. I remember a beautiful eight hour flight with Ray to Brazil for the World Social Forum where we caught up on all sorts of things, but you probably all know it, Notre Dame, you're very lucky to have gotten him. He did amazing work also at Oxfam. So I, I first want to applaud you all for taking on inequality and in human development. Much uh, a, a subject that needs much more attention. Um, and before I just say a word about about myself and how at IPS we've dealt with these issues. I did just wanna note that we're, we're sitting here today on day two of, of the horrific Russian invasion of the Ukraine. Um, and, and so just to realize that I'm sure for many of you in the audience, part of your brain is in your hearts are with, with the people of Ukraine. Um, and so I, I, I simply wanna say, a step forward in that horrible war, as well as on the issues we're gonna deal with here today, is informed debate. And I salute you all for taking a day and a half of your time uh, to grapple with these issues. Um, Ray gave you most of my background. I, I grew up in New Hampshire. I've lived in Switzerland when I worked at the UN. I've lived in, in the Philippines with my wife, Robin Broad, who's been my constant collaborator over these years and recently have spent about the last 10 years going back and forth with Robin to El Salvador for the work around this book. Um, I came to the Institute for Policy Studies from the UN precisely because of one of the people Ray mentioned, Richard Barnett, who had written the first great book on the outsized power of global corporations. It was called Global Reach. And I came and, and he really focused in on this imbalance in the world, maybe one of the great inequalities between the growing power of global corporations and the power of communities and, and workers. Um, and I came and convinced him to work with me on a, on a sequel. Now, 
quickly, I, IPS addresses these concepts of globalization and human development in a particularly unique way. So we think the greatest response to inequality are dynamic social movements from below. So we work with them and have for decades uh, to per pursue human rights and, and human development. As I came in, a lot of the emphasis, this was in the 80s and 90s, was on the unequal rules and institutions that govern the global economy. And I wanna say it was very exciting to be able to work with people from labor unions, environmental groups, women's groups from around the world who were both protesting these unfair rules and institutions and working together on, on what would be better alternatives. Um, and the one final point I wanna say on this, I mean, to inject a little bit of hope right from the start in this conversation is each year our Institute gives out a major human rights award uh, to outstanding groups in Latin America and the US in the names of two of our colleagues who were killed in Washington 46 years ago by agents of the Chilean dictatorship. Um, this was Orlando Letelier and Ronnie Carpen Moffat. And we've been marveling at IPS in recent weeks at how amazing developments that are happening right now in Latin America um, have come out of some of our awardees. So just to quickly say, in 2019, we gave the award to environmental defenders in Honduras fighting against a big mine. They went home, eight of them were put in jail. And just last night, uh, the beautiful photos, check this out uh, on Twitter, beautiful photographs, they were released uh, because of the election of a progressive leader, Xiomara Castro, who has replaced um, 12 years of terrible dictatorship and with an approach on human development. And then um, going a little further back, 2012, we gave the award to a group of Chilean students, most of them your age, the age of most of the people in this audience, uh, who had closed the country down to try to make education affordable in Chile. And in November, one of them was elected president 35-year-old Gabriel Boric, also elected on uh, an agenda of taking on the environment and, and pursuing human development. And looking ahead for the rest of this year, two other big elections in Latin America, and one of our awardees is the lead candidate in each, Gustavo Petro in Colombia, Lula da Silva in Brazil, and both again will pursue much more of an approach towards human development. So um, we've been honored to have these associations, but I wanna give you a sense, great dynamism coming from that part of the world. Well, we love to hear about your work uh, at the Institute for Policy Studies and the great things that the Institute is doing. Um, we also would love to hear a bit more about your own path um, and would wanna know what motivated you to get into policy studies and activism. Just in a nutshell, how would you describe your path? Yeah, thanks so much. I, I'd love to ask, well, I know a little bit of the answers from Maria and Stella, but I wish I could ask you all that same question. It's a, it's a great one. For me, a spark came when I was 15 and my father took me to Haiti for the summer. He worked in a, in a hospital in the middle of Haiti in Albert Schweitzer Hospital as a doctor. And I got to sit in a public health clinic, but, but make friends with Haitians, learn their culture, and get a sense of, um, well, the beauty of the people and a country outside of my own. Um, this really got me interested in the developing world. In, in college, I came to Washington on an internship. I, and I wanna encourage any of you who are trying to figure out what to do this coming summer. We have wonderful paid internships at the Institute for Policy Studies and the announcement will go up in a week or so uh, on our website. Um, but I came to a group that was fighting against the U.S. wars in Vietnam and Cambodia and Laos. And again, I fell in love with the people from those countries and the conversations about their aspirations uh, for their countries. Um, I was able to put together majors in development studies in college and then, and then uh, in graduate school and was fortunate enough to have a professor. So this is why you should always go to people like Ray and others, but one who'd worked at the UN and helped me get an internship in Geneva at the UN Conference on Trade and Development. Um, 
which was the institution set up to serve and work with developing countries. And I wanted just to share one lesson from that work that's really motivated me and given me a sense of the difference that research can make uh, in the pursuit of human development. Just to say at that moment, some of you will know this, developing countries came together. It was right after 13, the 13 big oil producing countries had formed a cartel, pushed up the price of oil, uh, and gotten a lot of revenues in the process. And across the developing world, people were saying, and this, this is what this UN agency was doing, was could we do that for coffee or cocoa, get producers together, raise prices, and address that aspect of inequality in, in the global economy. And I was assigned to bananas. And I was asked, we were assigned the task, if you could raise and uh, if you could raise the price of bananas, say a dollar a bunch, um, who would benefit? And I got teamed with a senior researcher and he said, okay, let's dig into this. And we went into what would now be known as supply chains and what we called the banana dollar, looking from the retailers, the banana retailers to the shippers, to the companies like Chiquita that produced them. And we came up with this astounding conclusion that of that dollar increase, 89 cents would go to the corporations. Only 11 cents would stay in Honduras. And this very good researcher pushed me further. He said, okay, of that 11 cents that stays in Honduras, how much goes to the banana workers? And again, we dug deeper and we found that, oh my gosh, nine of the cents would go to the businesses in Honduras who've linked up with Chiquita, only 2% would go to the workers. And depending on whether they had a union or not, they might not see any benefit from the increase in the price of bananas. And that was a beautiful example to me that it's very important to dig deep beneath the surface through good research and challenge the assumptions of what at that point was the conventional wisdom in the developing world about what would make human development better. Yeah, that's really interesting. And as we've touched on before, I think it's really uh, crucial to look at the underlying motives. A lot of people are really motivated to do um, good work because of you know, certain principles, but kind of digging deeper, what are we actually doing to address inequality? Um, it's like talking about the root of the problem. So- You know, of, yeah, no, go ahead, sorry. Kind of switching gears here then, um, as we run with the time, um, some questions about the water defenders, which we've already introduced, your book with Robin Broad about um, corporate mining within, within El Salvador. So could you explain for our audience um, what your experience in, was like working with the water defenders in El Salvador and how this is a David and Goliath saga really of how a community united to protect their land from these large corporate mining companies. Yeah, sure, absolutely. And just one word before that on inequality because it's so central to this conversation. And, and I think along with the pandemic and with the climate emergency is, is the most pressing issue in the world today. I simply wanna say as we attack it, and we'll get into this in, in a second in the water defenders, there are several inequalities that we're grappling with. There is the outsized power of corporations versus communities. I'll say a word about that in a second. There's that growing gap between the 140, 160 or so poorer countries and the 40 or so richer countries. There's the inequalities of, along gender lines and race lines that I know you're dealing with in some of those panels tomorrow. And then there's what's perhaps the most alarming aspect of inequality today, which is the growth of billionaires versus the poor in almost every society, growing number of billionaires um, versus the poor. And vital to focus in on that. There's many, I think, good things going on in that sphere. I was talking with Ray a little bit beforehand that we did a study with Oxfam last month on how if you simply put a small wealth tax on the world's billionaires and multimillionaires, you could fund global vaccine uh, programs for the whole world. So I, I urge you all to, to sort of embrace this issue um, in, in its complexity in those different realms. Yeah, with the water defenders. Okay, it was the same human rights award, 2009. The committee comes forward, says there's a group of people in Northern El Salvador, they're fighting to save their rivers. They see a huge threat in global mining companies uh, and they're doing a great job, give them the award. So we did. 
And we called them up and said, you can bring two people. And we got a hint at what great organizers they were because immediately they said, we want to bring five. We want you to organize a tour of the US after the award ceremony. So we turned to groups. I think we turned to Ray at Oxfam and others and got more money all ready to bring the five. And then we got a shocking phone call about a month after we told them that one of their leaders had been assassinated, one of the people who was going to come, Marcelo Rivera. Huge shock. And then soon after that, we heard another shocker, which is as these water defenders had convinced their government to slow down mining, one of the big, two of the big mining companies had introduced lawsuits in a secretive tribunal at the World Bank against the government of El Salvador for as they argue, taking away future profits. Um, our work got deep when they came. They came in October 2009. And this is what's so interesting, I think, about good rich country, poor country work. They were very clear on what they knew. They had dived in. They've learned a ton about mining. They'd learned that it used a huge amount of water, that it used toxic chemicals like cyanide to separate the gold from the rock, and that would poison their rivers. They learned a great deal and they had taught others in their community. They had built a coalition. They said, don't worry about us. We'll fight to end mining in our community and, and, and later in the whole country. We need your help to study these companies and also to study the secret tribunal. And that began 10 years of wonderful work together. And let me just end with the spoiler alert, because again, on the, on the theme of hope, in 2017, because of these movements, El Salvador became the first country in the world to ban all metals mining to save its rivers. And six months earlier, they defeated this horrible corporate lawsuit, which was demanding $350 million uh, in a unanimous decision in, in this secretive tribunal. So, I mean, my, for me, if, if poor people in a poor country like El Salvador can do that, there's no limits to what we all in this conference here together can do. Well, we love to hear this sort of success out of the David and Goliath story that is the water defenders versus corporate mining. And um, we would love to hear also about um, sort of some conflict within the country as well. So um, in the early 90s, El Salvador was coming out of a civil war with the white right wing party as the dominant political power. Um, in your book, you tell the story of a conservative representative, right soul, who took a, non, a non-traditional initiative to support the mining bans. What do you think are the key issues within the United States and abroad that must be addressed by transcending such traditional party lines? Yeah, it's a great question. Most countries, let's take El Salvador for a second. In that country, in this fight, about a third of their legislature was more progressive and say pro-human development. Two thirds was conservative. So the water defenders on the ground knew they would never win if they couldn't win over some of those folks. Um, one of the lessons from that fight, and this would be a lesson, oh, and of course in the US, you all know this, we have a divided government. We have in the Senate, 50 Republicans, 50 Democrats. We're not gonna win much if we can't win some people over on the other side. I think one of the things that the water defenders learned, and this is how they won over that conservative uh, legislator that you, you talked about, is that if you frame your campaigns in a positive manner, I mean, at the core, they were fighting mining and mining companies, but all of their campaign was framed in a positive way. Their main slogan was water is life. We can live without gold, but we can't live without water. Water, not gold. And it Turns out in that nation, well, a bunch of big businesses depended on water. Agribusiness depends on water. Tourism depends on water and clean water. And hence they, water is a good theme. I think on water, we can win a lot of uh, things together. I think there is the potential now with climate. I mean, think of the climate disasters of the last year. They've wiped out tens of billions of dollars worth of business for corporations, small and big. Right now, conservatives still are holding back on, on climate solutions, but climate is one, given that it does affect everyone, where, where I think 
we can work across boundaries. And, and finally, just quickly on inequality, it's interesting. So this, the, the, all of those issues I just raised about inequality, they of course are pulling together social movements around the world, but yes, we'll need some from more conservative circles to win on them. It's interesting that I'm seeing, feeling this very much as I go around the United States, um, a lot of conservative people, even Trump supporters, feel very angry towards the big and powerful, billionaires, corporations. They think they've gotten a raw end of the deal as well. And actually in polling, taxing the wealthy and large corporations is popular. It's, it's well over 50%. The hard thing is getting the politicians, many of whom take a lot of contributions uh, from those very uh, corporations and wealthy people. But I think in other words, there's a lot of opportunity to bring people who don't agree with you on a lot of things together for wins and, and fights against inequality. Very interesting. And something that we'll have to think about a lot, um, not only within the United States, but abroad about like what it means to really have and stick to those traditional party lines, because they shouldn't be defining on a certain agenda all the time. Right. Um, but kind of transitioning then to an international look on what the Water Defenders was talking about, um, the El Salvadoran water defenders invited Governor Padilla from the Philippines to provide firsthand insight about like the environmental, social, and economic aftermath of what really multinational corporate mining looked like in their country. Do you see any present day issues that could be better addressed through this kind of collaborative international discourse? Sure, absolutely. And just a word about Governor Padilla, bless his soul. Um, in all the work that any of you do in development, you will find, you will come up against people who are lying to you, who are throwing forward arguments that you know are false. In this case, in El Salvador, the mining company, as the opposition to it grew, said, look, you people in El Salvador, if you could just see our mine halfway around the world in the Philippines, you'd know what a great sustainable mining company we are. They of course were counting on the idea that no one in El Salvador had ever been to Northern Philippines to see this mine. Well, it turns out that Robin, my wife Robin Broad and I had been, uh, we went back again during, in the middle of this fight and we saw the horrors of a big open pit mine and its impact on water, on fish, on, on farmers. Uh, and this great governor also saw all of that. He had been fighting that mine uh, in his country, and he agreed to travel halfway around the world and testify before the Salvadoran Senate, meet the president, speak in large public forums, and he exposed this big corporate lie. And that was turned out to be one of the key Achilles heels of, of, that, of that corporate argument. Now on that, yes, international cooperation is key. It's key to ca tackling, obviously, now the pandemic to climate and inequality. Um, and I think here, just a, a word, um, the UN is one place where this collaboration comes together. It's good at setting norms on human rights, goals like the, the sustainable development goals. It's great at research. I mean, if you all, if I could point to one wonderful collaborative, global collaborative research effort. It's the Human Development Report of the UN Development Program. It's really advanced our understanding of what human development is. But just to say, we, my experience is we need collaborative action across borders at all levels. And a lot of it will be civil society coming together to learn from each other, to get inspired from each other. Think of the global climate marches led by Greta Thunberg and and indigenous youth from the South. It's inspiring, you share stories um, and um, governments can't do everything. I, I'll end with just one inspiring example of this. Um, mayors of big cities trying to address climate have been meeting together for 20 years. They started with 20 of them. It's called the C40 Cities Initiative. Then there were 40, now there's over a hundred that get together set goals, share best practices, and push cities to make the transition from fossil fuels to clean energy quicker. We 
we want to move on to discussing in a bit more detail our conference theme, which um, is relating deeply to inequality, as you've already touched on. Um, and so we'd like to move towards sort of focusing on inequality um, in a bit more detail. I think one of the prominent uh, water defenders is Fidalina, who you mentioned in the book. But really what we want to focus on here is the upside down world that she references to during her speech at Washington DC when she was accepting the prize from IPS. And she asked why El Salvador wasn't the one suing the mining company if they were the ones who were actually threatening the well-being of her country. So where else do we see examples of this upside down world today? And what can we do to address the issues of inequality that feel woven into our global human history? You know, so one of the biggest challenges we're facing is that the key global institutions that are set up to deal with, with the problems of the global economy were set up in a previous era to solve different problems. By the way, this is a key issue with Ukraine right now too. The key institution in Europe is that NATO, this North Atlantic Treaty Organization, which brings together the nations of Western Europe and the US, it was set up to fight the Cold War against the Soviet Union, which has not existed for over 30 years. And efforts to create a successor have failed. That's part of what's behind this crisis. But on the global economy, the key institutions were set up after World War II. The number one issue, well, it was rich countries, and a few developing countries, much of the developing world was still under colonial rule. And they set up big institutions, the World Bank and the IMF to help the world rebuild from World War II. These are the central issues. They are not set up to deal with inequality or climate or the pandemic. And new institutions set up since then, likewise, the World Trade Organization, that secret tribunal that we talked about, they were all set up under the notion that push countries, and this is where you've gotten the title of the conference, this tricky word, I use, you use inclusive growth. Part of the key problem of these institutions is that they measure progress through one indicator, which is growth. We need institutions that can step back look at things like the Human Development Report and the different set of indicators that are set up there and measure progress a, a, along a, a very, very different, um, a very, very different set of, of guidelines. It's, so it's a key challenge. Um, we either need to change these institutions set up long ago or create new ones. And, and, and just one final thought on this that, that to, to throw out to you all, which is, one of the shortcomings of these institutions is the players at the table are just governments. But there's a great um, clue from the first global institution that became part of the UN system. It was set up 103 years ago, the International Labor Organization. It brings to the table governments, businesses, and representatives of workers. And it's actually become the most, one of the most dynamic of the UN agencies because it's got workers at the table and businesses and the institutions of the future for to tackle inequality, climate, the pandemic, they will need representatives of social movements of civil society right at the table to be equal partners. So Pope Francis's Laudato Si is a call to action that urges us to care for our common home and aspire to integral human development. We're a Catholic university. We understand that the church was very relevant um, in your book, The Water Defenders and, and their work. So we'd like to discuss this in a bit more detail. Um, this this um, theme of Laudato Si provided courage and an impetus for the Water Defenders movement. So in addition to large corporate mining, how do you see inequality linked to environmental issues today? Sure, well, there's two big key issues. It's thank you for raising that because it's I'm sure forefront in most people's minds here. The first is that most of the greenhouse gas emissions, emissions in the world today come from the rich countries and China, yet the worst aspects of their impact mainly hit developing countries. So that's one key problem. And the second is that within any given country, it's the rich who are the biggest emitters and the biggest polluters, and it's the poor and poorer communities that tend to bear the brunt of the impact. Um, 
Now, I would say the good news on, so those two key inequality issues are central to any solution to the climate emergency. I think the good news here is that the world is waking up to the climate emergency. More and more nations are putting together bold plans. President Biden has tried to put, or, you know, we're on the verge of potentially winning some fairly large things uh, on climate paid for by taxes on the, on the wealthy. But the key will be, we need to do this in an equitable way. And, and I wanna just raise one challenge from this, leave you with one challenge, because I think you're, many of the people in, in this audience will help, you know, you're gonna be central to the solution of this. As we shift from fossil fuels to clean energy, part of what we're learning, and our Salvadoran friends taught us this too, is that some of the key technologies of the clean transition, in particular, I'll say electric cars and solar panels, require a ton of minerals that have to be mined. And we just you know, explained a little bit some of the problems of, of large industrial mining, but lithium, cobalt, and so on. Most of them come from poorer countries. And again, we don't want this energy transition to uh, complicate the lives and, and create more problems for communities around mining. I think part of what the water defenders have taught us and their allies around the world is we're gonna to have to stop some mining. We just can't mine in some places where ecosystem systems are fragile or where there's earthquakes or typhoons. And therefore, to make the transition, to get those batteries for the electric cars and, and to build the solar panels, we're gonna to have to one, just recycle the heck out of metals. I mean, in the US, we only recycle about 30%. We need an economy in 10 years. So some of you will become engineers and so on. We need an economy where we're recycling 90% of it. Um, and secondly, we need a shift. We need to end the love affair with the private automobile. We need a huge shift. This is happening faster in Europe towards public transportation. Uh, President Biden in this big infrastructure bill just put three times more money into highways than public transit. We need to flip that on its head. So there are solutions, but just be aware that how this energy transition is done to save the climate will be key to whether it's equitable or not. Yeah, definitely. And I think that's a good point. And as we talk about the future, kind of wanting to close out here with our questions, Toward the end of your book, you allude to, quote, the debate over the question of what constitutes progress, shorter term financial gains or longer term preservation of communities and natural resources, which is omnipresent around the world. And this really highlights progress as an agent that really deepens poverty and inequality. So what then is an idea of progress that can be harmonious with this concept of buen vivir, or that's to say good living in Spanish, um, that El Salvador has modeled for us. Yeah, thanks. It's a nice one to finish out th this, this part of the program with. You know, I said a tiny bit about it before. I think one of the key things we've got to change is those two big institutions that have such influence over global economic development, the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund, they lead their reports every year with one figure. They say, this is how fast the global economy is growing. This is how fast developing countries are growing. If you're growing faster, you're doing better. If you're growing slower, you're doing worse. We know that's not true. We know those figures actually measure what's going to the banana companies and the retailers and the shipping companies, not to ordinary people. We do have better and different indicators of growth. So part of it is changing that. But I also just want to leave with one example. I mean, I'm curious, if you were all there, I'd say, what do you think is the most equitable country in Latin America and why? So just a word on it. Um, 40 to 50 years ago, there was a big push from these global institutions on Latin America to grow fast by bringing in big agribusiness firms, big ranching companies, big mining companies. And most of the countries, grabbed onto this to quote, get rich quick. Uh, in the end, a few of their people got rich quick. But the country that said no was right beside El Salvador, it's Costa Rica. And there the government took a longer view of things, not this short-term corporate uh, approach uh, to development. 
And they said, okay, let's set aside a quarter of the country into different forms of protected areas, national parks and other forms of protected areas. And let's, now they still did some agribusiness, they still did some ranching, but they largely have stopped mining, 2010, 11, 12, not quite as thorough as El Salvador, but a lot of it, and said, let's more focus on um, preserving those areas on organic agriculture and on ecotourism. And millions of people go into this small country every day because it's because a quarter of it is protected. It's, it's beautiful. It has great species diversity. So it was a simple decision. And they are now the, the least unequal country in Latin America and, have, and the general well-being measured by those other indexes is extremely high. So there is a choice. There are models. Um, there are different paths to, to, to human development and elections in Latin America. It's not just Costa Rica, but I mentioned Honduras and Chile, hopefully Colombia and Brazil are pointing in this direction. Well, thank you so much, Mr. Cavana. We're really appreciative of your answers to our questions. I would now like to move into questions from the audience. So if you are in person, you're welcome to raise your hand. And for those watching virtually, um, you may have a Google form in the live stream chat. If not, it was emailed to you. Um, so feel free to submit questions via Google form and we will read them out in person here. So raise your hand if you have any questions here. And if not, we'll be checking on the Google form. I'm taking this to mean that everybody agreed with everything that I said. <laughs> I want to back over We have a question over here in the back. We're doing a little bit of a mic swap situation, Mr. Cavana, so hopefully you'll hear them soon. Hi. I don't know. You can't see anyone, can you? I can't see, but I can hear. That's okay. Here I am. Um, my name is Annie Conahan. Um, thank you so much for your talk. Um, I was wondering if you could give us advice as soon to be graduates who care and want to make a difference and want to address inequality, what advice you have for young people going into the world um, on their career path and um, just moving forward, what we should look for, what we can do, where the bright spots are um, and where we go from here. Wonderful. No, thank you for that. So I would say from, and this is, we're, we're all basing it on our own experience, but I'm also looking at the people I admire in this work. And I find one thing, I'll say something sort of unorthodox here on this. Um, there's tons of people who are well-meaning in this work, but I try to sit and think who's effective. And, who, and here's what I found. One, People do a better job if they learn one country really well. Uh, Robin and I went deep on the Philippines, now El Salvador. Don't try to understand the whole world. Go deep in a place because that's where you'll get the guts of problems and you'll learn, you'll learn with people on the ground how, how to solve them. Um, so that's one. Two, it is good to go deep in an area, even as you continue to follow the broader debate. I mean, for me, I learned corporate research. That also made me more useful uh, to, to the movements that I've worked with. Um, but there are many different things. Some of you know one, I think, Maria, you're going to go deep on education. Um, Stella is on, on, on healthcare. This is critical because it, it makes you more useful. The other thing I would say is um, I went to work at the United Nations before getting into this work with social movements. It helps to have some experience in an institution which has some power. I even encourage people, go work. Most corporations have a social corporate social welfare department. I'm not very impressed with most of them. I mean, partly because there's, their job is still to maximize profits to their shareholders, not human development. But, but if you work in a corporation, you learn how they operate. That makes you more effective in trying to influence them or challenge them. Um, government, the same. The UN, the same. So I think all of those are good. And then I just want to say there is a vibrant world 
of organizations, both social movement organizations. I just got off the phone with the head of Greenpeace USA. They're doing amazing work and taking on climate. They just hired this amazing, this fabulous trade union lead, leader to bring together labor and environment. So there's great social movement groups, but then many of you I know there in the audience watching online are going to be researchers. Um, there's a lot of institutions and you can pick your area. There's some that focus in on environment. There's some that focus in on social justice, some on racial justice who work closely with movements. And um, my, my emails on the IPS website, if you, if you have questions about specific groups and whether they're effective or not, um, feel free to, to reach out to me. But they include, I mean, and if you're there at Notre Dame, ask uh, Ray more about Oxfam. It's one of the best, Action Aid, Grassroots International. Um, there's a lot of great groups, but don't rush it. I mean, do get that training, get maybe some, some of the job experience in one of those institutions. Um, and then you can have a wonderful, fulfilled life, learning from and working with people around the world. Thank you so much. That's a great answer. And I think it really embodies what Stella and I hope to do as well. So mm -hmm. that's really useful. A question over here in the front. And Mr. Savannah, this question is actually from the co-chair of the conference from last year. So an honored guest. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry to embarrass you, Annie. Hi, Mr. Kavana. Thank you um, for all of your insight. Um, so we're talking about these large multilateral organizations like the United Nations. Um, but as we all know, the United Nations, and particularly when we're thinking about development projects, um, the World Bank have contributed to um, have contributed in, in negative ways um, to development um, in in certain contexts. And so, how receptive are these organizations to activism, and how can um, we bring in these grassroots voices that you're talking about um, to influence decisions at that level? Yeah, that's that's really it's a great question. I of course came into this work in an era when there was massive activism aimed at these institutions. Um, among other things, there were large protests uh, against the World Bank and IMF. Tens of thousands of people came, many of them students from around the world, as they learned about those negative impacts. Now that did have some impact. It did change. The World Bank now has a huge um, area of work around climate. Um, but I think part of the problem is simply size and scale. They, they give money on such, in such large amounts that it's very hard to do that in a way which actually helps human development. I think they become less relevant in the world. Part of those movements marginalize them a bit. Countries now turn to other sources of, of both aid and, and advice. I think they were discredited. So I think that's positive. I still wouldn't give up on them. Uh, I still think it's worth pressing them. They have civil society divisions and so on. But I would simply shift um, attention more elsewhere. When I think of El Salvador and what institutions from the outside were actually doing good, what stands out, well, Oxfam is in there in, in, a, in a very positive way. But another one, here's a country that's desperate for water, very water short. There's a group called Engineers Without Borders, similar to Doctors Without Borders, that's in there working in specific communities, helping people tap into the stream down the hill from their community and pump water in a very inexpensive way up to their homes. So a lot of, of the best work around human development in the developing world is happening from institutions out, outside of that large system. UN agencies sometimes do better. I mean, the big health organization is the World Health Organization. They have helped eradicate disease around the world. So I, I, that's an interesting one. But when it comes to economic development, economic aid, um, we have tended to find just much more dynamism in in smaller uh, non-governmental organizations working working around the world. And there's happily quite a few of them. I think we have another one, Scott. Thank you very much for 
for the presentation, Mr. Cavanaugh. Um, I would like to ask about the politicians of El Salvador and the, represent, the political representative. I come from a Latin American country where these this, uh, environmental problems are very common. And usually the, the, a factor that is present in all these conflicts is the lack of presence of the politicians, the, the broken channels of the representative um, authorities. Uh, so I'm afraid that uh, these problems appear frequently in different parts of the territory all, all along Latin America, but especially in those countries with small or little inst institutional in institutions that can respond to this problem and can help the people that has less power. So my question is, uh, what happened with those authorities that do have, that did have the, the power resources in this uneven scenario to um, have, I don't know, legal initiatives or to conduct the, the country to um, um, avoid a social conflict and preserve the, the, the environment, as you said. Right. Well, you know, so the world over, there is a problem that most people who end up going into elected office, since it takes a lot of money to get elected, become corrupted in the process and become beholden to the people who've given them money and then they take power and then they don't care about the environment, they don't care about human development. I So, so two counters to that. One, it's fascinating in the United States uh, to watch the last five years. We got our wake up call with the election of a horrible misogynist uh, billionaire president. And that shot people into all forms of activism, but one channel was to, uh, to put your name forward to be elected to the US Congress. And if we sit in, I sit in Washington, I watch, spend time with what is called a Congressional Progressive Caucus. It's been beautiful to watch people come out of social movements. This Progressive Caucus, which has 95 members, is run by an amazing woman who was born in India. Her name is Pramila Jayapal from Washington State. She was an immigrant rights activist. She's now a brilliant, totally uncorruptible politician. Um, AOC, Cori Bush, Ilhan Omar, these amazing people have run and won. You see that in some parts of Latin America. I think we're gonna see more of that. But in El Salvador, it was fascinating. Maybe a third of the politicians, the members of Congress were positive, were open to the water defenders, were trying to come up with a way to deal with, with mining. But this is what flipped the conservative ones. And this was the brilliance of the movement. Every politician does get up in the morning and they read public opinion polls. They don't want to push for things that are unpopular because that's what will get them unelected the next time around. So the water defenders did a brilliant job of educating themselves and then conducting great education campaigns all over the country. So using, this was Marcelo Rivera, the guy who was killed, using theater, using community radio, using forums. So that by 2015, a public opinion poll showed that 80% of the public was opposed to mining. That was key to turning. I mean, you still had this, this very good conservative politician who became an environmentalist, but, but it was the public opinion polls. Nobody wants to vote for something that only 20% of the public supports. So that's, that's super positive. One final thing just to say, I, I encourage you all to like Google and then watch. Chile, in Chile where the student has just been elected president and takes power in two weeks, Gabriel Boric. They were dealing as many Latin American countries are with a legacy of dictatorship in the 60s and 70s. And they had a constitution that was written during the dictatorship years. So people demanded, social movements demanded a constitutional convention to rewrite the constitution and the basis of what that society views as important. And people were elected to it from all over. It's over half women. It's headed by an indigenous woman. They've got a fascinating way of figuring out what they'll consider for new parts of the constitution, but the rights of nature is up there in front. So this becomes, in addition to 
trying to get good people elected to legislatures and then trying to get our issues popular enough so that even the conservative politicians can't ignore them. But this is, this is a process whereby ordinary citizens are gonna have a major impact on the entire framework of um, Chilean society. I think we have one last question here and in the honor of time, this will be our last question. Thank you again. I feel like we're off to an amazing discussion that we'll be able to continue tomorrow during our research panels. Hi, Mr. Kavana. Like Gilda said, thank you so much for your time and your talk today. Um, so what I'm curious about is returning back to something you said earlier in your talk regarding uh, what you believe to be the most prominent and important form of inequality today that being income disparity between maybe the top 1% and the impoverished. Um, from an economic perspective, what are your opinions on minimum wage policies and other economic policies aiming to rectify this wealth and income inequality issue we have today? Yeah, great, really, thank you, great question. And so every country is now grappling with this. Um, and, one interesting, maybe one of the only silver linings of the pandemic is there are now labor shortages in many countries around the world, which is pushing up wages in many. But what we found at our institute is the key to tackling that form of inequality. Of, of, in the US, we have 140 million people who are poor and low income. We, we do a lot of work with a social movement called the Poor People's Campaign that's organizing uh, poor and low income people. So 140 million struggle to get by every day. That's about 40% of the population. And then um, we have several hundred billionaires who have more wealth than, than the lower 80%. So what do you do about it? And our strong view is you've got to do both. You've got to both pull up the bottom and absolutely minimum wage policies are key. In the US, a key part of that too is ending this inhumane legacy of slavery, but which is sub-minimum wages for tipped workers. In this country, if you're a restaurant worker, in some states you make $2.13 an hour. Ending that, that's a key thing that many people wanna do, raising those wages to a living wage, but you will not tackle inequality if you don't carry out policies to bring down the top. And that's where taxes on wealth of the very wealthy, um, taxes on corporations, taxes on financial transactions are critical. They are popular, but the only way we will turn around inequality and, and get it moving in another direction is very thoughtful uh, policies, both pulling down the top and bringing up the bottom. And, and again, Check out Costa Rica on that one. They have, they have the lowest gap so far. That's amazing. And at this point, we'll wrap up. Um, thank you to everyone for your questions. And Mr. Cavana, it's really been a pleasure to speak with you and get to know you and read your book. Um, thank you so much. Thank you to all of you and good luck to all of you. As well.